Professor Liang, received his BM and MM from New England Conservatory of Music and PhD from Harvard University. Okay. Okay. <laughs> he is currently Chancellor of Distinguished Professor of Music at the University of California, San Diego. Professor Liang is the winner of the Roman Prize, the recipient of the Golden Guggenheim Fellowship. They actually in the in the camaraderie of our chair in the public. He also received the Kuzovsky Foundation Commission, a Creative Capital Award, and the Bodar Nicholson Fellowship from the American Academy of Art and Letters. His concerto Shaoshan for Saxophone in Oxford was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Europe. In 2015, his orchestral work, A Thousand Mountains, A Million Street, won the prestigious Paul Mayer Award for Music Composition in 2021. Now, why do we invite a composer, the this year's speaker in the ancient lecture series dedicated to Buddhism? The relevance goes beyond the fact that he often draws inspiration from Buddhist sources. The connection actually goes deeper. Both music and Buddhism are about inner experience. Both excel in reaching the deeper depth of what we used to call soul. The word soul sideline for quite some time. As a contact in the middle year with a car hung about the content story. The noble card winner Roger and Rose be one of them. In any case, on them so or not, we all know that we have an inner landscape, an interior space. That interiority has a language of its own, a language of heart and mind. Both music and Buddhism. Specialized in matching the topography of that inner landscape. What you will hear from Professor Liang is the instrument of that mapping. He will introduce to us the project CD. Among them is the technological mapping of the inner landscape of Huangjing, one of the greatest 20th century paintings. The subject is dear to the heart of our historian, myself included. What Professor Liang does with the one landscape and at the outset may seem counter human mystic income, but there's a good reason. Using X ray fluorescence and other devices, he and his team reviewed different kind of physical properties of the ink, thereby familiarizing the way which we look at these things. So here's the rough. The device aided mode of capturing material properties of impact reveals an entirely different ink scale. It radically showcases how the machine eyes would see the painting and how our human eye would see it. Professor Leon's point is to set up different eyes and perspectives. In his words, eyes of a conserver, eyes of an art historian, perspectives of the cultural heritage engineer, and last but not the least, the perspective of a composer. This is where the plot thickens and things get really interesting. First of all, the net effect of all these perspectives serves to depolitize the conventional and authoritative mode of looking. It wrests the matter from the tyranny of the art historical regime, myself being part of it. So we are historians and the audience who want to educate are made fully aware of other modes of viewing 
uh, new dependency. More specifically, or more significantly, the difference is not just among the tribalized profession, such as um, conservatives, art historians, the musicians, and etc., but between the material property of physical reality and our human or cultural way of looking at things, the real thing can get to the level of microcosm, normally inaccessible and invisible to our human eye. It reminds us we don't necessarily see things, or our human seeing is a rather limited way of seeing. As a result of this, we might say that our unimpaired eye might not necessarily have an edge over that of the blind or near blind thing. Especially with regard to the heart of the matter. Nor do we, those of us working on visible things, have a fast track to the heart of the matter and matter of heart over musicians and those who specialize in individual children. Thing. Now, the second half of Professor Liang's talk carries its function. I wouldn't want to give away that too soon with a spoiler. Essentially, his project replaces the three old Bs with the three new Bs. The three old Bs are art, waiting for the drum. The three new Bs are Beluga wells, bearded seal, and bowhead well. No more spoilers. I'll leave. Uh, uh, I'll let him deliver his answer. Now, before I invite him to the podium, I want to put things in a larger context and perspective. The exploration in the image of the sound, the so-called music object or sonic things has increasingly gained momentum in recent years. Now, while the history of this exploration may go back to antiquity, a milestone laid by a German physicist named Ernst Platten, born in the same year that Mozart was born, and died in the same year that Beethoven. He noted the formation of intricate patterns of sand on the metal plates Played with a bow. There he was born a field of acoustics, acoustics, subsequently reinvented in the mid 20th century by the Swiss scientist Henry Jenny as cymatics. Uh, the invisible sound is here made visible. Music could thus be seen as material object and solid thing. Increasingly, the field has generated a new question in the frontier of the English Academy. If what makes the world and us primarily a matter of vibrancy and frequency, then if our, and if our cells are hardwired with vibrancy and frequency, then we all exist in the universe of echo chambers filled with entities connecting with each other across time and space through the same wavelength of vibration. Not coincidentally, this is very much in line with the ancient Chinese cosmology, primarily musically conceived. Last year, uh, Chen Chen Liu, or Liu Chen Chen, associate director of Power Canada, who is actually in audience with us today, published two groundbreaking articles on the subject of music world making in the journal made to that So it's all there. Now the theme also runs through the exhibition about a biocentric art in early China that I have curated and then conceptually designed by Harvard Hammond. The show is scheduled to open in four hundred and eighty June this year along with the massive catalog. Many of the contributors catalog are here with us in the audience today. Now this mixed media exhibition demonstrates how musical thinking informed early Chinese visual art of world making. So if you happen to 
travel to China in June, make a stop in Changsha to see the show. We also hope to bring the exhibition to this building in the downstairs in uh, uh, Canada. Okay. Now, the sonic world making also underlies Buddhist world of thinking. The idea of sympathetic resonance, Gang Yi in Chinese, underscores the universal psychic connectivity that links all sentient beings across time and space in the past. This larger backdrop explains why music making is highly relevant to the lecture theory that put it. We look forward to learning from Professor Liang what he has to say about his project of music world making by way of some object. I want to thank Simply Foundation and the Influent Network of Buddhist Studies for making this event possible. I'm also grateful to all the camera members and staff members involved in organizing the logistics of this event. So before I um, invite Professor Liang to the podium, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Reher, Reher, uh, uh, Her, uh, Director of Sidi Foundation, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Professor Wang. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening for everyone. Uh, on behalf of Tsuji at the lab. He's going to speak for us from Taiwan. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, is my voice is clear. Oh. Is my voice is clear? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Wang. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone. And on behalf of Tsuji, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to Professor Eugene Wang for hosting this lecture and supporting the Indian Network for Buddhist Study. And many thanks to Lona from Camp Lake and Vicky from UBC for coordinating this lecture. It's my honor to join everyone today for this very interesting topic about searching for home through music. Music play an important role in our spiritual practice, regardless of faith. From traditional chanting to song that incorporate Buddhist teaching and positive thought, music is an important medium. The global that activity is still a myth. <laughs> <laughs> A big part of that's yet to be fully in reality. And yes, the right music can generate compassion, inspire us to feel our interconnectedness with the cosmos and return to our pure original nature. Thank you, Professor Liang, for taking the time to share your work with mm -hmm. us. We look forward to hearing about Professor Liang's research and also Professor Shillerman and Professor Wen's insightful commentary. I'm sure the lecture will be provide us with new insight and further inspire us to carry forward the value of compassion and understanding in our daily life. May the lecture have great success. Thank you all for being here today. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you very clearly. Oh, did you? I oh, know he's not speaking right now. Did you start it? Oh, did you start it? I can hear you clearly. Oh. Oh. No, I think that's 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 that's
Okay, you're good. You're good. Yeah, can I, I can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry for this uh, little bit of inconvenience. And thank you, Professor Wang. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening for everyone. Uh, on behalf of Chiji, I'd like to express our deepest gratitude to Professor Eugene Wang for hosting this lecture and supporting the Yingzheng Network for Buddhist Study. And then many thanks to Lona from Camlake and Vicky from UBC for coordinating this lecture. It's my honor to join about searching for home through music. Music play an important role in our spiritual practice, regardless of faith. From traditional chanting to song that incorporate Buddhist teaching and positive thought, music is an important medium that can purify our mind, bring us serenity and peace. The right music can generate compassion, inspire us to feel our interconnectedness with this cosmos and return to our pure original nature. Thank you, Professor Liang, for taking the time to share your work with us. We look forward to hearing about Professor Liang's research and also Professor Shelame and Professor Wen's insightful commentary. I'm sure this lecture will provide us with a new insight and further inspire us to carry forward the value of compassion and understanding in our daily life. May the lecture great success. Thank you all for being here today. the best collection of his art and I spent so many hours meditating in the space so um it's a thrill to be here and thank you professor Eugene Wong I've been fascinated with your work since I was a grad student here and I'm so honored that professor Shalom is here you know you're a big reason I actually went to Harvard for, for a PhD so <laughs> so, so glad to be here and friends of course I think people are trying to get I wonder if this is a good moment to Make sure those who are standing outside the door can actually make their ways into the hall. Uh, I mean, I mean, like that. Yeah. 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 Please, um, Professor Bill Todd, is, uh, we had three years together at the Harvest Club. We fell into being a senior fellow. I was a junior fellow. It was wonderful to, to, to come back here. And uh, thank you for, for your patience. Um, I spent countless hours in the Blue Gallery, uh, white here, which I call essential. Being here reminds me of the study of Buddhist texts in my formative years, especially in Nargarjana. Translated by the great Umarajiva to Moloshu. This sastra, along with many other texts, shaped me spiritually and artistically. And I'd like to take Master Chen again. Follow the stream, have faith in this course. It will go its own way, meandering here, trickling there. You will find the grooves, the cracks, the crevices. Just follow it. And 
this is a perfect description of my journey in this rich and probing environment, and I would like to share with you some discoveries along the way. So, so now I'm going to start by inviting the talented young palace Chen Yihu to perform a movement from my conversation on Dolan Suite entitled Where is Home? I tend to face a musical and spiritual heritage that has a special place in my heart, the music of Inner Mongolia. I have loved this music since my childhood. One of my family's closest friends, the renowned Mongolian scholar Ivan Ji, visited our home in Beijing frequently. With a sip of alcohol, he would start singing, sometimes continuing late into the night. Many of these songs were passed down to him from the great Sokashi, who died in 1968. Others were from his mother, Kijiga, who died in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2005, who preserved Wu Qingduo, or Changdiao, long songs that no one else could sing. These personal memories date from the years after the Cold Revolution, when obnoxiously cheerful propaganda music flooded the airwaves. Yet it was these lonely long songs that evoked in me a deep sense of longing and awakening. The Mongols were the world's most feared conquerors, yet the music they sing today is not martial in turn. Quite the contrary, they sing of a mother's devotion, friendship, loss of loved ones, and their own love. Their melancholic sentiments are understandable, for the warriors 
were always far from home. These songs remind us of what it means to be away. Aren't we all living far away from home today? Chen Yu Hu's performance resonates powerfully with a sense of nomadic longing and deep melancholy that lies at the heart of his music. What is our home? And what will become of it? The Chinese written characters, especially traditional scripts, combine images, phonetics, and meanings in an interplay that often gave rise to poetic associations to concerning readers. Here's the word xiang or home, found in the silk script preserved in the La Wang Du Hong in Changfa, China. The word xiang or resonance, written by the Han dynasty calligrapher Liu Huan, was preserved in the rubble of the Liu Huan city, Taiwei Liu Huan Bay. It consists of yin or sound as its radical and xiang or home as its phonetic indicator. As a textual construction, the word resonance means the sound of home. What an evocative definition. As you know, there might be multiple ways of writing the same Chinese character. Xiang resonance can be written with a different construction as engraved on the Shi Chen Stili of the Eastern Han Dynasty. Here, the word for resonance consists of two parts. On the left, yin or sound, and the right, jin, landscape. The two phonetic, oh, I'm sorry, the two poetic definitions of the same word, xiang, soundscape, and the sound of home, seem to resonate deeply with what we are exploring in the 21st century. This leads us to ask ourselves, what is our home? Furthermore, when we use the word home, what are we referring to? Is it a place of origin, a nation, as in home country? Or is it a cultural or spiritual home where one has a deep feeling of belonging? And how do we listen to the sound of our home in the 21st century? I was born and raised in a musical family in China. In 1990, at age 17, I left Beijing to study in America at the high school studio in Boston, Texas. Ironically, it was in America where I discovered China. Being trained at the preparatory school of the Central Conservatory of Beijing, I had never been to an open shelf library until I set foot in the Asian Library of the University of Texas. What an amazing experience. Books printed in Chinese, simplified Chinese, English, traditional Chinese were all available to me. They tell different versions of my own story, which was unknown to me when I grew up in China. It was an encounter with what I came to call the transparency of knowledge. Knowledge that are accessible, ready for me to examine, interpret, subvert, reconstruct, and imagine. That afternoon, while standing in an open shelf library for the first time, was one of the most liberating moments of my life. My search for home began then and continued when I came to Boston for college education. Even though I enrolled at the New England Conservatory of Music, I frequented the Harvard Yanqing Library, searching for my own past. I browsed books, including screen bound volumes that were printed on rice paper. The texture of Chinese paper gives us a feeling of warmth and softness. The near physical touch of these fine pages conveys something intimate, from my fingertips to my heart, a sensation that cannot be experienced through downloading a PDF file. There, I fell in love with the writing of Hong Min Hong. A landscape painter, calligrapher, and a formidable scholar whose theories and historical insight offer me the key to understanding traditional Chinese monuments. I hand copied his writings, which was a good way to train myself to read and write traditional Chinese characters, something that was not taught in mainland China. I observed Huang's innovative techniques and studied his theories. In the seemingly dark landscapes of Huang's last creative period, for which he earned the nickname 
dark thing. Thing. Light seeps through dense and multi-layer pigments, resulting in an effect that could be described as luminous. I thought of him as my orchestration. There is an abundance of musical repertoire that takes the visual, be it a painting or a natural landscape, as their inspiration. Just think of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, Debussy's La Mer, or Gunther Schuller's Seven Studies on Themes of Conflict. Examples in ancient traditions that allude to natural imagery are countless. What can a composer offer beyond the sonic impression of what we see? My mind became restless. In 2007, I joined the faculty at the University of, Texas, uh, University of California, San Diego. Five years later, I was appointed composer and resident at the Qualcomm Institute and began working for Dan Wortman with software developers, robotic engineers, material scientists, and cultural heritage engineers. Creating works as an integrated team, our collaborations led us to reimagine our heritage in an acoustical and visual exploration. Our point of departure is the 1953 album by Huang Minghong, created after the artist had nearly lost his sight due to cataracts at the age of 87. This is the thing. Before exploring the question, how does music respond to pain? Let's start with what can we see? Or then you refine the question as what can we see that was invisible to us? When the Mojai Foundation generously loaned us Wang Yifeng's original album, our visual team, led by my collaborator, Professor Falko Kuester of the engineering department, took a diagnostic survey in four wave bands, visible light, ultraviolet, infrared, and other wave bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. We gathered high-resolution visible images at six gigapixels with a feature size of 6 UN, about one tenth of the width of the human hair. Our custom designed robotic imager allowed us to complete the analysis in a fraction of the time traditionally required for this sort of survey and with greater precision. The process of capturing technical images using different wavelengths of light, referred to as spec multi spectral imaging allows us to see the watercolor by Bong Ming Hong through a different set of eyes. Some pigments are transparent in the infrared region of the spectrum. So infrared light allows us to see beneath the surface of the watercolor. UV, on the other hand, is very surface sensitive. UV fluorescence imaging can reveal organic compounds like glazes or varnish, as well as retouchings. The final multispectral image from our set is the infrared false color image, where the red channel in the visible image is replaced with the infrared signal, and the red and green channels are blue shift. This particular combination is useful to provoke a response that is sensitive to material characterization, especially to distinguish between different materials appearing the same color such as red lake versus red cinema. We also use a non-invasive analytical technique called X-ray fluorescence, or XRB, or XRF, which shows us the elemental content of a particular spot on the paint. For the stamp, we further confirm the presence of cinnabar when we saw mercury with XRF. This tool outputs a spectrum detailing chemical information about the materials that make up the game. We'll come back to XRF later. When looking at the multi-spectral images, we're given the ability to see the paintings in a whole new light. A chance of exploring one type of diagnostic image with the new lighting involves lighting the painting from behind and capturing the transmitted light on the other side, and it gives a luminous view of the artwork. The question is not only what we see, but how we see. We can choose the eyes of our conservatory, looking for vulnerabilities in the paper 
potential interventions over time and state of preservation. We can choose the eyes of the art historian trying to create the artist's progress or process, their technique, how they create it. We can combine the two and add the perspective of the cultural heritage engineer, asking about genesis, anatomy, and the pathologies of the artifact. In other words, what are the materials? How has it been made? How has it changed over time? And how do we best preserve it for the future? The original dimension of the album is 46 by 32 centimeters. Each individual shot covers an area of 36 by 24 millimeters with a 66% overlap with this neighborhood image. Thus, Hong Bing landscape is divided into 1,820 micro images. Each is a landscape painting in an archipelago giving you two examples of that. They are stitched back together and projected onto a large display wall of 967 by 272 centimeter, consisting of 32 large models, as you can be standing in front of that wall. <laughs> With technology, a miniature landscape painting truly assumes the monumentality of a landscape. Furthermore, with the aid of a joystick controller, one can fly into the landscape as if riding on a drone. What a ride that is. One savors the previously unseen details of the fiber inside of the white paper, its unevenness and unexpected cracks. The fascinating traces of blue left on the paper as light ink spreads through the page. Once eyes meander through the idealized landscape, revealing the beauty of a blind artist's inner vision. To the perspectives of a conservator, an art historian, and a cultural heritage engineer, we can add the perspective of a composer. Can the paintings be made audible? Can the pigment be heard? Instead of creating an oral impression of the vision, as musicians have done for centuries. I was curious to find out if we could paint like Wang Binghong himself using a sonic brush. Wang Binghong was highly innovative in his techniques and theory. His techniques of using seven kinds of ink, including Su Wong, overnight ink, five kinds of brush techniques, nine kinds of water techniques, numerous goggles at the end, and texture and swim techniques were all well documented. Inspired by Fong's theories and techniques, our audio team developed the following software tool to create sonic brushstrokes. We focused on aspects that was translatable to sound, including the nuanced space between layers of ink with different gradations of darkness, and his dotting technique that he constructs contour and outlines into a plethora of brushstrokes what we tend to call sonic harmonies. Here are some examples of software that our team developed. I'm not going to do this. But I will just focus on the very last one. MIAP was designed by Zachary Seldes, was used for multi-channel sound spatialization throughout the world. It was used to control a custom software that blurs sounds in time, as well as move them around a space with multiple velocities. Here are two images of MIAP software, which traces Hong Ming Hong's calligraphy of the characters Shan, or mountain, and Shu, or water. Please note that the two words combined, Shan Shui, refer to landscape, or the venerable genre of Chinese landscape painting. How do the visual and the audio components speak to each other? In my electroacoustic composition inspired by Hong Ming Hong called Hearing Landscape, these tools enable me to paint with sound. Here's one example. The X-ray fluorescence analysis conducted by Dr. Samantha Stau reveals Hong Ming Hong's use of dairy, an unusual material that had not been previously documented over large areas of the album. 
the discovery might shed light on Bong Yi's practice from a new angle. The visual spectral filter developed by Dr. Greg Sergis corresponds to the spectra obtained from specific X-ray fluorescent analysis points on the paintings. Functioning as a sonic filter, The materials on this painting are made audible. Furthermore, the software Mia traces the sound frequencies in space that match individual characters on one and white. This resulted in sound movement that literally The sound of the painting is materials. This resulted in sound movement that would follow the same path that the brushwork one would perform during the living. Near the end of this movement, the wind like to Norton's move around the space following the master artist's photographic strokes. The painting and its materials are finally heard. Does this exploration depend on expensive, multi-monitor display, light electronic processing, and fancy speaker configurations with spatial master sound? Not always. By collaboration, inspired to compose Newman, he's following us for solo piano, and the South Mountains and Living Streams for orchestra. A short excerpt from the lab reveals an instance of multi-modality, where I derive the harmony from spectral analysis of recordings made with pieces of quartzite rock. When I composed the piece, I couldn't help but remember the hunging home in near blindness, envisioned a luminous landscape that arose out of the ruins and ashes of post-war China, offering a glimpse of a landscape to come, perhaps a place to come. I was raised in a conservatory environment and trained to compose music mostly performed on a concert stage. In previous collaborations, I worked with musicians, dancers, choreographers, painters, playwrights, poets, visual artists, filmmakers, and architects. Our work on Bong Joon-ho's landscape painting broadened my collaborative partnerships. In the years following the Hearing Landscape Project, I intersected with oceanographers and geologists, starting with the sonification of the coral reef with Professor Stuart Sandman and underwater acoustics with oceanographers John Wilson and Dr. Drummond at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. The term university in Chinese, Da Xue, means great learning. But what makes learning great in the 21st century? How can a university nurture an ecosystem that promotes great learning and to create opportunities to reimagine the mission? And what is the importance of listening in all of this? How do we listen? Why do we listen? What is it, what is it to listen? Who is listening? I set a simple threshold for myself. If the work can be created in a conservatory, I have not worked hard enough. Perhaps music making and critical listening can find a more engaging role in the broader community than within the confines of the music. With the generous support from Snow Chin, um, here, <laughs> the Qualcomm Institute launched Layback. It was created with the conviction that we're living in the age of an inevitable convergence of arts and sciences that the entire university is one indivisible unit that creative listening offers unique potential for learning and that we need to collectively and imaginatively respond 
the issue challenging all of us. Yeah, that's my bad. Uh, you can tell most of them are scientists, <laughs> uh, from, from engineers to software developers and, and uh, oceanographers and geographers. Six Seasons is one of several projects that arose out of my collaborations with oceanographers. According to the Inuits, six seasons in the Arctic are not demarcated by a fixed calendar, but by what we hear in the changing environment. The Chukchi Sea, north of Alaska, is one of the most inaccessible places to humans on Earth. Hydrophones designed by Professor John Hildebrand and the Whale Acoustic Laboratory were placed about 300 meters below the sea surface at a seafloor recording location 160 kilometers north of Uchiavu, Alaska, to capture the sound of ice and marine mammals throughout the year. These sounds call for a different way of listening, challenging our temporal and spatial orientations. Our ocean is dynamic, unpredictable, and full of incredibly complex sounds, including sounds humans cannot perceive, and sounds that are vital for the survival of marine mammals. Increasingly, these sounds are drowned out by anthropogenic noises, including industrial activities and passing ships. Today, we can no longer pursue any empathy with the ocean merely from the comfort than the fixed perspective of a beach chair. Our ocean are in crisis. Many marine mammals use echolocation to navigate in their living environment. We humans are not endowed to echolocate in the same way, but metaphorically we do. The practice of sending out a signal and listening to its enriched echoes underlines these meaning, interpreting, and communication in general. My composition six seasons for any number of improvising positions mirrors echo location, call, and echo. The call is the pre-recorded sound that I describe as the living score that function as interactive model. The echo is the improvising position's creative response intertwined with the original signal. Just as ice and wildlife are the living score that Indians set their lives to, the musician's role is as much about listening as about responding creatively to the pre-recorded sounds of their instruments. The sound of ice and marine mammals transform our musical practice. When I brought these sounds to musicians, our old model in Western classical music, symbolized by the three big Bs, Professor Eugene already reminded all of us who they are, that model was subverted and replaced by the three new big bees, beluga whales, bearded seals, and bowhead whales. The musicians experiment with these sounds constituted an instrumentation lab where new playing techniques, notation, and composition strategies were created. In six seasons, our sonic journey begins on October 29, 2015, just three days after new eyes had started to form at the listening site, the story of ice. There is so much to learn. Ice sounds produced by various movements such as nyla sea ice formation, sea ice dynamics, and internal oscillations, snow crystal with ringing spikes combined with surface wind, geothermic pressure, storm, dominate this part of the world, spanning the mostly dark months from October to April. What is it like to invite an oceanographer to a rehearsal and mingle with the musicians? Very unusual for all parties to say this. When a violinist presses his bow onto the string, an oceanographer may hear air pressure and movements of the ice formation. The ensuing conversation takes us outside of the jargon of musical terminology. Musical interpretation is neither 
by new horizons of imagination. Artists tend to feel a little self-conscious about what we, we can offer the scientists in this collaboration. Art means science, but does science mean art? <laughs> My collaborator, Dr. Jones, uses tea as a metaphor to describe our relationship. The data recorded by hydrophones compresses all underwater sound onto a hard drive, flattening their complexity and contents into a single layer. When played back, the individual nuances are often lost, like textures pressed together in a condensed cake of tears. Musicians respond to these sounds by adding water to the tears, reviving and revealing their rich complexity. Artists are the tea makers that transform tea leaves into a fragrant cup of tea that one can fully appreciate. It unlocks the magic stored as digital signals on hard drive, converting electric signals into sonic nuances that invite a listener's search for meaning. A lot of preparation goes into making a cup of tea. When the reported data, more than a hundred of years are reported, in duration was shared with us. They came with lots of undesirable bodies, noises from the computers rebooting that occurs every 75 seconds. <laughs> the clicking and thudding of the hydrophone being moved by water current, etc. To restore the pristine sound of an ice pop or beluga whistle is to work like a sculpture, revealing the beauty hidden in a piece of raw marble. I didn't make this restoration process any easy for our team members, Dr. Theo Harris, Dr. Treacherous, and Dr. Nicholas Salone, when I insisted on using free software so that our method can be adopted by anyone with different users. Perhaps the most meaningful gathering we have is with visitors from Han Inlet, Munaburi, and Maine, who came all the way down to San. These annual visits bring high school students and community leaders to our lab at the Broca Museum. Our team will project the high sound onto the speaker's position on the ceiling so we can experience the sound the way the underwater mammals do. The ice is the sky. It is always a special experience listening with these visitors to sounds that are from their own waters, where for centuries their forebearers hunted for subsistence. They knew these sounds well, as they knew intimately how far a bearded seal could hear a hunter's footstep on snow, far better than a modern day scientist could measure. Yet, the sound of home becomes unfamiliar, as no one until now has placed their ears 300 meters from the sea surface. I often teach a group of undergraduate students with different musical backgrounds. Many of them are eager to share with me the greatest game music that I seem to miss out on. While I'm always curious, I might not be the easiest to be convinced of its greatness. Likewise, when it is my turn to explain the mastery of the child credit, it takes an equally great effort, if not many. <laughs> but I can never forget the moment when I played the recording of Sea Ice Brothers. We were taking a break from our seminar, and I told the class that they were free to leave the room while I put on the recording. With no further explanation, the sound of ice started popping, gradually enveloping the room. No matter. Everyone was glued to their seats. Their eyes closed as if they were in meditation. It was their first time hearing the sound, yet its importance was immediately evident. Its beauty self revealed Perhaps somewhere deep inside, they recognized that the ice was the sound of the home, our physical home, a home that we, no matter where we come from, all belong. <laughs> Listening to the sound of the Arctic makes us recognize the home illuminated by sound, to quote the phrase by my collaborator. For centuries, musicians from different cultures have portrayed inspiring sceneries for the sensation of being in nature. Today, some compositions respond to climate change 
the titles that reference subjects ranging from rising sea levels to melting ice to bring a heightened awareness and sense of urgency to the listening experience. In what sense does the music make us understand our physical home with new insight? If the composition offers us the same materials, same methods, same perspectives as in the past, it is essentially the same music, except with a catchy title. The convergence of technology and art allows us to hear the earth sing, giving us ways to understand its resources and implications, inspiring us to think differently. You might recall from the earlier part of my lecture that X-ray fluorescence analysis combined with visual spectrum theater enabled us to make pigments audible. This experiment only deepened our curiosity. Can we listen to the earth's mirrors, each with a unique harmony of the dog? And how can the earth processes of weathering, erosion, sedimentation, and eruption teach us about musical form and structure? The potential is limitless. Let me briefly describe two methods developed by our lab with input from Professor of Geology, Emily Chin. The software developer, Dr. Gabriel Zalas from Michigan, started with a set of 188 minerals. Here's an example of how one of the mineral harmonies was generated. The elemental composition in this graph is extracted visually, then transformed by our software to map its range to the 88 key from the piano. This range is adjustable. So is its tuning, degrees of pitch and proclamation, amplitude, etc. So here's the result of that chord. I think it's a very beautiful chord, but you have to listen a lot to understand it. Okay. <laughs> Am I losing it again? <laughs> <laughs> Always have another voice. Beautiful voice. Maybe my computer is getting off. So let me try one. Uh, I'm going to give you 188 harmonies. You have to be able to identify all <laughs> A second method responded to a set of 128 minerals. It was developed by software developer called Belinda, which sonified the X ray spectroscopy in musical tuning system, granular synthesis. Charles summarized the method as follows X ray spectroscopy involves bombarding materials with X-ray radiation, causing electrons to transition to higher valence shells and emit photons when returning to their initial states. The wavelengths and this frequency of photons emitted are characteristic of each element of shell transmission. Transposing these frequencies down by 50 octaves situates the emission of virtually all naturally occurring elements within the audible range allowing the pitch relationships between them to be heard score. So there's another volume of mineral harmonies coming out of time available to all of us. Our seminar draws participants from various departments, including visual artists. The image in here was created by one of the participants, the visual artist Ming Ming Chung, who utilized a data set of real mineral images provided by geologist Emily Chin and created the artwork using generative AI technology. Coming back to Hong Mihong's calligraphy, Shan Shi, Mountain and Water, which refers to the genre of Chinese landscape, what started as a sonic and visual exploration of Hong Mihong's album B became a journey into the Arctic and the minerals. Today's Shan Shi encompasses the entire planet its oceans and earth, waters and continents, mental atmosphere and beyond. The 11th century Chinese painter Guo Xi 
when describing Shantri painting, he said, a mountain looks this way close by, another way a few miles away, and yet another way from a distance of a dozen miles. Its shapes change at every step. The more the farther it goes. It looks this way from the front, another way from the side, yet another way from the back. Its aspects change from every angle, as many times as the point of view. Thus, one must realize that a mountain contains in itself the shape of several dozen or a hundred mountains. It looks this way in spring and summer, another way in autumn and winter. The scene changes in multiple seasons. It looks this way in the morning, another way at sunset, yet another in the rain and shine. The matter and appearance change in both morning and night. Thus, one must realize that one mountain contains in itself the manner of several dozen or hundred mountains. Shan Shui is not a replica of natural world, but an idealized mission enriched by a multitude of viewpoints and experiences. Imagine adding to this vision the perspective of material science, data science, software development, oceanography, geology, musicians, health scientists, and artificial intelligence. When Wang Dinghong painted in near blindness, his inner vision illuminated the Shan Shui to come. And our explorations into both the soundscape and the landscape of our home bring us a similar transcendence, a Shan Shui that illuminates both our past and our future. So I'm going to end soon. I'm going to invite, uh, but let me, before I invite him, Return to the stage and perform the last movements of my composition, Mongolian Key. Let me conclude by saying the search, quest, and longing for home is part of any long story. Listening is an indispensable part of that journey, as it sheds light on the meaning of life for all of us. With our natural, cultural, spiritual, and physical home melting away like the disappearing ice caps. Our search for the Thank you.
I would restart my career. <laughs> I think I think I'd rather be a little bit harder than harder. Because in the race for the human heart, you guys do have a faster time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are very fortunate today and uh, having this extraordinary speaker and player 
and um, it made me feel that we certainly really make the right, which I thought I could go a bit over my head about this. But, um, but thank you so much for really showing So uh, we're not done yet. Um, um, we're very fortunate to have two discussions with us uh, uh, this evening. And we'll start off with uh, our Professor Keishan, uh, who probably will actually have to find out as our, our, our safety word. Um, um, she actually she is my, my uh, often a neighbor in the library. <laughs> my, my room is four or five, her room is four or three. But um, um, she is the G. Gordon Black, professor of music and professor of African and African American studies at Harvard University and former chair of the Department of Music. And so uh, uh, as a musicologist who is a PhD from Michigan, um, her work her books include music ritual, um, Palashka history, um, and in fact, a full long list of books, a uh, song of longing, and it's in the yeah. journey, it was in Christian Chan and anthology, uh, let Jasmine rain down, song of remembrance among um, Syrian Jews, um, and the northern textbook, um, Soundscape for music in changing the uh, a changing world. And so on. all every single one of them you see one five of another. In other words, she's she's fully fully She she should walk with all that metal with all that. Um and um and then uh, and then uh, uh, an article as well, and she also has been awarded uh, many major fellowships. Uh, in, um, including Guggenheim Foundation, uh, which we have a happy reunion among ourselves. <laughs> um, another tribal member. Um, she also has uh, started a new project on um, the introduction of African Jewish music studies along with the Yatara uh, during the development of the creative or Herbert Cap Center for Advanced to uh, Today's Study and Music in Albania. She's the past president of the Society of Ethnomusicology and in 2012 completed terms as a congressional appointee to chair the board of the trustees for the American Book Life um, Center of the Library of Congress. She's also a fellow of America Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Jewish Research. American Philosophic Society and Ethiopian Academy of Sciences. And she held the Chair of Modern Culture at the Library of Congress during 2007 to 2008 with National Tibeta Kappa uh, Frank Akbai Memorial Scholar during 2010. Uh, 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 as you can see, um, extraordinary illustrated by Benjamin Scholar and as I said, uh, children in the world before. Um, I said, well, you, you essentially accomplish in your lifetime what takes 10 of us. <laughs> so, without further ado, uh, uh, so for the beautiful introduction, much too long. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk and a wonderful performance. Um, now, I have an admission to make. For many years, I have loved Leiliana's works, and I have a special affinity for the extraordinary string quartet, Gobi Gloria, which is a celebration of Mongolia's Gobi Desert, which is, of course, the largest desert in Asia and part of the historical Silk Road um, and uh, the sound portrait of the Gobi Desert and, of course, the Mongolian Street as well. They're very different, but they have some really strong resemblances as well. 
um, are just extraordinary, and I think convey not just his attachment to the region, but to the Mongolian musicians who are important to him. So there may be a very major dose of technology, but there is a lot else going on here, including some very human connections. And he has said, and I think mentioned briefly, that it was in America that I discovered China, uh, largely from my colleague, I think, Wulang Chaotian. Um, but this experience of discovering home when one is in diaspora or in a foreign land is shared with many who are forced to migrate um, in, and they then go deeper into their home region or nearby regions while living permanently abroad. So this, is, I think, is shared. Um, I think that Leilian has always been known internationally as a composer more than China, who immigrated to the US as a teenager, he told him the story, and who has shaped a remarkable career. And I have always thought of him as an intercultural individual and composer, um, less of one home than many homes. And all, he came to the U.S. following in an older cohort of Chinese composers who were forced to migrate during the Cultural Revolution. And um, I can only say that the migration of Lei Liang and some of his other colleagues have provided the United States with a wealth of musical talent for which we can all be grateful and inspired by. The lecture tonight shared his belief, and here I quote, that composing is a way to free oneself from the artificial confines of cultural identity, a means to challenge the perceived borders and convenient labels. Indeed, you've accomplished that many times over. And we have also heard and witnessed at Lei and has moved beyond a highly creative intercultural musical style to something that is yet more interspatial, yes, technological on one level, but very ambitious. And we've been fortunate to have him speak about the techniques that have shaped the Mongolian suite and so many of the other works, especially his hearing landscapes where he uses electro acoustic techniques to render the visual audible, and hearing ice skates where the world of oceanography and sounds of ice cracking are conveyed through musical sound and its manipulation. Now, let me just briefly comment on a few major themes I take away from Le Leon's talk and his music. First of all, themes of home and nostalgia. I think home and Le Leon's creative imagination becomes not just a geographical or cultural space, but the greater earth itself and the natural landscapes and seascapes that give it life. He has innovated new processes of geological listening based in the explorations of a renowned landscape painter and his calligraphy. If music is about home and the multiple places that reside in our memories, these sounds of home have resonance and amplify the relationships of sound to home and related cultures. Often lately, I'm going to be a scene calls on Chinese characters and concepts, and I hope our other respondent will talk more about those, which I can, to invite multiple aspects of his being into the listening experience. He invokes the concept of resonance, and this leads me to the second point, where resonance moves deeply into the domain of synesthesia. Synesthesia is a neurological phenomenon in which one sensory channel, such as hearing, leads to involuntary arousal of another cognitive pathway, such as vision, smell, touch. Lelian has in recent years explored the evocation and activation of multiple senses through which listening becomes a full body experience, you might say a full <clears throat> environmental experience, and through which some or all of us are associated with diffuse places. Music becomes multi-channeled and experiential. 
Um, and I think we can see that this happens with the luminous nature of pigments from the inspiration of Chinese painting and calligraphy. He moves from light conveyed by pigment to deeper concepts of orchestration and use of sound. His experience as a composer in residence at the Qualcomm Institute has enabled him to cross sonic and technological boundaries. Synesthesia is no longer just an inner relationship of the five senses, but the awakening of endless domains in which perceptions of the natural world are transformed by new technologies. I have been fascinated as Lele Yang details how producing technical images within multispectral imaging, for example, we can both see different colors and the same color through new eyes and ears. Here he proposes a luminous view of painting as a model for luminous listening. And a final brief point, we have also learned tonight a new vocabulary between moving for sound, between sound and landscape, sonic particles, and various forms of synthesis based on artistic Chinese dotting techniques. These techniques uh, uh, unite the visual and the aural in innumerable new ways. I can only express my awe with the work at Qualcomm and then with the uh, oceanographers in your lab indeed spell a new convergence of the arts and sciences. These newest projects with oceanographers and geologists enable the sonification of uh, mountains, of coral reefs, and underwater acoustics. Here we can all applaud the new 3Ds. Yes, we all <laughs> were attached to this metaphor. Um, I, assume, I should say also, I appreciate greatly Lele Yang's sensitivity, not just to sound, but also to the ethical issues, such as insistence on free software, in order that a new modality of listening that he's introduced to us can be available to all. And just a few final thoughts. We've been treated to an emphatically 21st century presentation, sharing with us a conception of music that fully explores the union of arts and sciences by developing new methods for enhancing sensory perceptions through music. Let me express my deep gratitude to Lele Yang for sharing with us these new and deep perspectives of sound's possibility and the way in which all of us inhabit broader worlds, sensory experience that exist above, below, and beyond geographical boundaries. If home is where one first encounters sensory experiences, Music can, over time, convey a more global location, shared not just with other cultures, but with myriad landscapes and seascapes of the natural world. Thank you, Lydia, for a truly transformative lecture, one that instructs us about what the arts can convey to the sciences and to the transformation of our listening experiences. Thank you. Now you know what the difference between art history and music art <laughs> We read and say things they see. <laughs> That's a fundamental difference. Now, um, our second uh, discussion is uh, Hui Wang, uh, associate professor of Berkeley, who's a virtuous, world worth uh, performer, teacher in Chinese music studies. In fact, um, a good occasion for in some ways she follows Lilian's footsteps and uh and uh Lilian kind of shape. So, uh, yeah I'll so I wouldn't yeah I'll spoil her but okay. She's known for her adventurousness in passing musical boundaries. Um, she has particularly in some facility um with the traditional Chinese uh, music instrument of Chen uh, and has experimented with it in refreshing ways. Now she's the recipient of the Golden Bell Award in Beijing and uh, recognized as a rising star in the international competition. She's the recipient of the Beijing Music Independent Award and the Emerging Artist Award Fellowship that recognized pioneering efforts in integrating performance with 
smooth dancing and other forms of genres. Professor Wen is also notable for putting boundaries in connecting traditional Chinese with the global musical landscape, uh, with groups such as the Global Music Ensemble at Berkeley uh, and the uh, um, New England Revolution. <laughs> The current project is particularly fascinating for us, and we really have a uh, way, a full address for um, how it's going to be developed. It's a rivers of resonance, it's supported by the Berkeley Faculty Development Grant, and it pushes music uh, experimentation to the horizon of elemental soundscape, water, the rhythm, which I am sense that there's a deeper connection with what you are doing and what. Um, and so we can and so um to and uh it's very related to um engagement in this function with that uh professor Chin. Uh, so, um, Professor Liang, before uh, I study with you, your, uh, your point today, I'd like to share a bit about my connection with you. <laughs> yeah, as you may know, I, I think a couple years ago, I was the first uh, student who played uh, traditional Chinese instrument accepted by the University of Berkeley, the region of non-profit management. Uh, and after, after my graduation there, I uh, got the tradition. I started to teach at the Pepperton School. Um, and uh, since 2019, I promoted college teaching. Um, and the uh, gradual I opened the new doors at Berkeley and NBC. So some students have a similar new platform with me. Um, and you might ask, how do you know this? How do you know the new tradition? How do you know you can? Apply that department with your team. The answer is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professor Liang introduced the, the basic because he read it on the research and he told me that department is really um, unique. By the way, other totally classical style department that you see. And uh, in that department, is, you can you know, limit it around. You can do anything, you can create your personal style, you can. Cross the boundary, um, cartel. Yeah, I just want to thank you. And you this year made you open the new uh, universe and the new world. And also, um, it is a way for more students to come to your full study. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then, so, respect to uh, Dr. Young's points, uh, I will address two aspects. Firstly, how to find code. Uh, based on my background as a Chinese Chinese instrument former educator, specializing in Chinese classical music based in Virginia, in the state, home means a lot. It could be a place for identifying ourselves, cultural, and uh, navigating cross cultural exchange to foster personal and music glory. So, in my journey, my identity as a Chinese performer and is really central and foundational. Uh, whenever I calibrate with different musicians from different genres or engage more in compositions. However, bring this instrument from fear and finding aspiration at home is new cultural environment faces a lot of challenges of survival and growth. Yeah. So currently I'm teaching at the Berkeley and NEC, which are real music schools. That incorporate Chinese traditional music and performance art there into their uh, core curriculum and showcase their uh, commitment to inclusivity and diversity. Uh, some people are frankly just curious my job because you are teaching performer. What class are you teaching there? And what is your teaching method? And what is your teaching goal? So, yeah, apparently, at this both school, they don't have specific Chinese community. Chinese Institute. At Berkeley, the courses what I teach under uh, Berkeley State University, I can say uh, I, the course I offer under CMA Contemporary Art and Art Museum there. Yeah, so 
those ancient fusion of a welcoming, lovely, inclusive environment. I love them so much, but they cannot cross country. So, how do I survive there? <laughs> I should ad ad adapt my teaching method and align with their curriculum and missions of this institution. And it uh, also required me to know it the challenges in the border context. Exercising is relevant to be part of global Yeah, and also my primary goal is to ensure that my students, especially for some students who play traditional instruments, not only succeed, but also gain recognition for their artistry and their contribution. Uh, but after inferring some sharing points today, um, this material, I would love to add one more thing to my teaching goal that is assist my students to find their home and to help them flourishing and find their own lives. Yeah, but I still remember my first global concert in the States over the Chinese flower, which indicated through my artistic expression, one firmly grounded in my homeland and the other absorbing diverse influences in foreign countries. Yeah. And then secondly, uh, I will have a question for Dr. Uh, as an educator, I'm currently in some, uh, with students through engaging interdisciplinary uh, project as a professor teaching from um, nation I have with my own project on the river of residence. Uh, Dr. E. Tony Grant and Dr. Tony Fauci, which will focus on the five rivers in the world. I create very rich some original music for folk tunes based on local uh, music to for cultural exchange. Uh, and I recently attended a lecture last week named the Composition for House. Very interesting uh, topic and highlighting the need for musicians to excel not only in their craft, but also in technology reflecting the fusion of art and science in today's music industry. So inspired by Dr. Young's work in working youth with technology, I also do mention artists in scientists and also scientists with artists, right? So I have a question. Uh, from an educational perspective, I'm considering what it truly means to succeed as a musician. In today's music industry, and what skills should we prioritize for small educator and students? Very thoughtful question, difficult question. So I would invite Liang uh, yeah. to just to get to the next chapter and then. Uh, very quickly, and then we can open the floor to the audience. I'm sure a lot of people have Yeah, are we doing okay with time? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, a little bit of time. Bit of time. So, so we'll be all terms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Well, you, you tell us when we should stop. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm really not um, uh, in the position to answer questions to tell people what to do. <laughs> so I just, uh, but um, I can tell you what uh, maybe served me very well uh, when I was a student at Ennis and also at Harvard. Um, the, the rule I give myself is um, um, that besides the music that we all have to analyze and study, just read one book outside of music and read it. Mm -hmm. uh, simply that. Because uh, we're all individuals and all the people are on campus. They're all very special. It's one is very special. So there's no curriculum. That can fit everybody. And, and I think it's just the success of uh, educational institutions is to provide an environment that everyone can become themselves. Fully develop those potentials. Don't follow what is trendy, what is, you know, whatever. Yeah. So so there's really, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any answer other than that. So <laughs> read more books. <laughs> but, and I did mention reading books is a sensation. Uh, just being able to touch. In fact, I'm going to visit the Harvard Yenji Library later tomorrow. Just those going to those shelves. Uh, you know, the university has become so convenient and we're so spoiled. Now I can 
simply call Lord and deliver to the front desk. I no longer need to go into a, a shelter anymore. That's a loss for someone like me. I would love to get lost in the shelter and, and, and to find some good, so touching. All of those, you have no idea how that's going to transmit some really important information other than so the character uh, printed on the book. So, anyways, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Um, I actually want to share a bit of my um, share with you uh, today because our acquaintance goes all the way back to the days when he was in the Satan I do remember talking, which is remarkable. How did you reverse that order? Okay. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, so, I was befriending him and all want to learn uh, one thing or two uh, about music. But then he obviously was so tired of that kind of request because I haven't been music since my childhood. I don't know about music. So all the time he would peck me and try to get us to talk about cultural history and the other things. It's like, hey, we want to hear music from you. He's like, no, 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 I'm like, all these other things. Well, um, so he was one of the most active members back then to organize all these kind of seminars. Um, variety of <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so we have a very tight schedule. And uh because we have food the food down there waiting for us on the So Maybe quickly, some type, any questions? Yes. Yeah, first of all, um, I think how much um, and also our two amazing leaders and our two leaders, uh, this amazing uh, afternoon talk. Um, I am representing another group of audience in the next room. So that today the lecture is so popular, so we have to set up a live stream um, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the next room. Um, so I have collected several Questions from that group of audience. Three questions. The question about the six seasons. Um, so, what were some of the most significant challenges you faced in integrating the natural sound of the Arctic into a cohesive musical work? Okay, well, we can start with that. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, the, um, that. The very fact that we're engaging with the sounds of the ocean uh, is challenging because it's completely disorienting. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, there are a lot of sounds we couldn't even hear unless our technology came to download all of the image. And all of that richness is inaudible until we can review it to um, The little whales don't listen to music like we sit in office chairs, they're constantly moving. And sound means so much to this creature that, in fact, if you imagine yourself in the ocean, to be part of a community, you can't see each other. You can only hear each other. So the great um, oceanographer and physician, Roger Payne, who really made the humpback whale so popular after he died sadly last year, he changed the word uh, herb of mammals into herb, H-E-A-R. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we have a lot to learn. So I think the first thing I need to do is consider just going to take something and just say, this is what I've got to use this, which is a very utilitarian kind of way to that. Uh, we are students first. We have to know how to listen. Right? And imagine ourselves, what does it mean to listen to the sounds? And how are they produced? And very basic parameters of sound, such as what is a place, you know, um, if it's a field of seal compared to a political whale, uh, their reads, they can hold the record very, very different length of time. So a song um, by a little piece over an hour now. And um, so, first of all, it's completely changing all our uh, fundamental kind of knowledge of things. But this is the kind of thing that's also very exciting. Uh, because we seem to have developed the theories and knowledge of language to understand what we do, we try to describe it with words, counterpoint, on and on, saying none of that applies. 
<laughs> so you really have to come up with new words. And I think that is one of the most interesting things as I collaborate with people outside of my field is that it's essentially creating a new language that we can use to understand each other, right? So language that doesn't keep us in the wall of our departments. Yeah, and that is a very creative process. Um, and well, it took me a whole year to talk to my engineer, but a whole year to learn what he's saying <laughs> until we have our own language. So a 10 minute coffee break, we come up with all these new projects. So <laughs> yeah, so it's the it's the uh it's the emergence of that language that transcends these things that help us to understand each other more and can and dream together collectively about more important topics that are relevant. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question. Um, it's about um, about your future directions. Um, <laughs> how do you envision the future of musical composition with the increasing um, integration of technology and interdisciplinary collaboration? Mm -hmm. Are there any specific technologies or specific fields that you are specifically more specifically excited to explore in your future project? question and I will not say what is the future of music that's <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do uh, take these projects very seriously and they usually take many years to develop so uh, they come in different phases um, the reason I engage with technology uh, starting with Armenian paintings developing software so that it appears in it and develop software that will allow me to paint uh, with the sonic rock but the sonic particles those things we train my ear. You know, I have learned all, all anyone who have who are in this room have learned anything about salt and all that. That's basic training that we all went to, but that was the last century before. And how we listen to these things take a very, very different kind of sensibility uh, to listen. So I think with the aid of technology, that was the first step. That's why I go there first. I don't go to a piano and I, <laughs> but I listen to whales. Uh, I develop the technology to be able to transpose it to all of the range, slow it down, speed it up, all these different things that help me to listen and look for data on the start of the end um, And then I move away from technology. Um, uh, my most ambitious work is to involve no technology whatsoever. Because the technology embedded in the cello or piano is also fabulous. <laughs> and, and so I, as I mentioned that uh, after Doing all the experiments I could do with uh, the theory landscape project uh, regarding home and painting. I wrote a piano solo piece that doesn't even really involve touching anything inside of the piano uh, because I think there's a lot to do with the capabilities. And you see, when you're building with piano, uh, you don't have to take it for down because you just experience twice the piano. <laughs> <laughs> piano is the most reliable piece of technology. So I go there, and then the next piece I do is on the and that made the most. Difficult, time consuming. Uh, but uh, every time I do like the last piece, uh, um, inspired by Hong Yun, the 30 minute long, one movement piece, Tian Shan Wan Shu, thousand hours, a million minutes. Uh, yeah, it took me several years to develop what exactly that I did. For example, just the harmony that comes out of blocks, how you analyze and extract these harmonies, go through them, and then make them sync with the objects there. Uh, that was challenging enough, and I'm now stuck with the idea of how to compose the ocean. Uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm in the middle of it. It's a very, very challenging. I have no idea what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One last question, and then we we'll come back. The conversation will continue down, down there. So, so <laughs> well, last question, and then I'm uh, so lucky. Thank you for the uh, uh, wonderful lecture, Cheryl Lee. And, uh, and you picture us uh, so many, so many Indonesian artists, the, the vision and the thinking. Because I have a really good talent from China Academy for Arts. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Huang uh, Yifong is our academic. Yes. Uh, so I am so familiar with the paintings at this time uh, about the landscape in the Western Lake and the Hangzhou. Yes. And so in that storm and the carriage <laughs> for me, and when I looked at the painter. And uh, there are two questions I and the illumination for me. The one, and uh, what your lectures and uh, remind them 
and something like uh, you know you talk about uh, uh, the four C and talk about the how the uh, traditional uh, landscape and uh, the theory. Then another one, and uh, the, you know, the six canals and the made by Xie He. And the first one, Diuhua, the first one is Xi Yue Shen Dong. And I, I know that some translation is English, and uh, translate the Xi Yue Shen Dong uh, is uh, not the spirit, spiritual, or, and another word is very special, the reader. And the reader and the, to connect the painter theory to the musical. Theory together. So I wanted to know much more about it. You make me to think about this concept. This is the first question. And the second well, question. Maybe second question will continue with Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So very particularly, maybe. So I wanted to know yeah, much more about it. And also, that's uh, really our yeah. uh, uh, entire semester worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, perhaps a brief response. It's a very interesting one you mentioned, Tia Plus Lupa. The presence of some kind of pulsation and rhythm has been perceived by theorists like uh, Atiyah uh, centuries ago yeah. when he's writing. So there is something about hearing what is going on on a piece of paper or silver that can only be described by words that don't necessarily apply to a visual experience. But I think there's already a very interesting threshold that was being crossed. And interestingly, that is the single most important quality that Chinese start to understand as, as something that is the most vital for further learning in terms of thinking of um, the hierarchy of what you need to accomplish as an actor in major. Um, rhythm is part of musical life. And um, what I could say is that I call Hong Kong my orchestration teacher, uh, but it's not only orchestra. You know, I, I think that seeing his painting as a masterful musician, uh, and there is a lot of rhythm in there too. Um, so when I see this, it's never a static experience. I want to see that painting moving, for example. My eyes cannot stay still, and I can read with it. Anyone who has been to the Magic Palace, if you see any of these great works, such as the Cixi Fie Autobiographical Essay, for example, in Baisu, you dance with it because it's more like a film instead of just a painting. If you want to scroll a text scroll, it's the same thing. It needs you many things because it's a journey inside of it. And that involves time. So one thinks that music is the only art that involves time. That's wrong. <laughs> For painting, it involves time too. Uh, and there is a very important essential type of experience that has to be part of that dimension. I think you understand. Um, I remember the, the person who loaned us, the great collector, Tommy, loaned us this original Hong Kong. Um, he made a request. He said, please don't move on the image too fast. Very interesting how, what does it mean to see this thing? We're always moving, but do not move too fast. And that is telling us a lot about hearing the rhythm of a thing. And what is the wrong way it's a right way to choose to write with a I'll end right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. today, uh, uh, performed two magical surgeries. One is on our eye, another is on our ear. And you walk away looking and hearing. And that, I think, is quite a transformative experience. Thank you very much for all the Speaking of time, uh, tomorrow is actually going to be a full day symposium uh, organized by our region China uh, in the evening from here, uh, starting uh, when? Oh, 10 30. 10 30, starting 10 30 tomorrow. So you have more, more time to. Uh, attend a uh, uh, better presentation on the issue of time. Uh, and I want to close here. Oh, please uh, join us uh, for reception, drink the food uh, in the B level of the building. They can pay. Uh, and, and then uh, 
and then you have conversation with the person around. Thank you. <laughs> 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 